Now, maybe some of you are still shuffling your paper and figuring out where you're going to put your drink and so forth. So, so let me say that again, kind of an attention getter. Uh, the more, and I have found this to be my experience, and perhaps you have too, but the more I know about God, the less I realize I know about God. That uh, The more I come to understand, the more revelation uh, I receive about this galactically vast God that we serve, the more I, I begin to get, get a hold of just how vast he really is, and, and just how small I am comparatively, and therefore the more I know about God, the, the, the less I realize all there is to know about God. You tracking? It is a paradox. And, and listen, man, I, I am okay with that. In fact, I have come to invite it. I want to feel the bigness of God, and, and I want to feel very small in that. And the closer and closer I get to this unspeakable difference between the thrice holy God and my tiny little self, the more I am compelled to what? To worship him. J.B. Phillips said, and I know I've given you guys this quote a number of times before, J.B. Phillips said, if your God is small enough to understand, then your God isn't big enough to worship. And there's some real wisdom to that. The, the idea is the point I'm trying to make here is there is an endless well of discovery available unto the believer. There is never a degree of boredom in the pursuit of God because the more you discover, the more you realize there is yet more to discover. In short, we are to Embrace the mysterium tremendum, right? We are to embrace the mystery of God in Christ. Listen, Christian, mystery is your friend, all right? Mystery is not your enemy. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us that the secret things belong to the Lord. This side of the resurrection, man, we are just not going to know all there is to know. And yet, the Bible tells us that one day, we will fully know even as we are fully known. And so God has set us upon this journey of discovery, this track of discovery, and, and I, for one, wouldn't have it any other way. And so mystery, the unknown, listen, the unknown, it, it, it is not that which should push me further away from God, but it is rather the unknown that should compel me to worship and pursue him. And that's what I love about how God has, has set up and designed this track of pursuit. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. Let's look at it again. First slide here. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp a way around the corner and a light to my path. I, I, I read that wrong, didn't I? Your word is a lamp to my feet. Again, it's not this huge spotlight way down around the corner over there, but it's a lamp under my feet illuminating that very next step. And when I take that step, then the next one after that is illuminated unto me. And, and again, I love that. That is one of the most thrilling aspects about this journey that we're on, friends. I, I, I don't want to know what's around the corner, man. I mean, this is an adventure of the highest order. Listen. We pay big bucks, do we not, to see the latest and greatest blockbuster. We're, we're shelling out some cash to sit in a dark room and stare at adventure and mystery and suspense. And we like that. Why? Because it's safe. We know in two hours we're going to get up and walk over popcorn and a bunch of sticky junk out to our own little weird realities, insulating ourselves from the larger and far more compelling mystery of becoming who we are in Christ. Is it not a bit odd? Is it just me? Is it not a bit odd that, that paying for these little time capsules of mystery is an $11 billion industry in this country while we're put off somehow by the mysteries of God? Man, we love us some mystery, right? We love us some mystery for a couple of hours because it's safe. And yet we back off of the greater mystery, the greater journey, the far more compelling reality that God is inviting you and I not just to watch but to participate in. And so 
The more I know about God, the less I know about God. It is the way he has designed it, number one, that we might desire to pursue him, that we might be pulled into this grand mystery. And number two, and this is huge, that we might be drawn into a kind of humility that allows God to meet us with yet more revelation. Think this through for a minute and you'll see gospel design. As I come to recognize, I know less and less about his vastness as I'm growing in him. Are you catching me? As I come to recognize, I know less and less about his galactic vastness as I'm growing in him. There is produced in that an an ever-developing sense of humility. And it is in that place of humility where God can grant More and more revelation. Is that making sense to you? God opposes the proud, the Bible says, right? And gives grace to the humble. It it, it is his beautiful design. Now, Mary here, understand that like you and I, Mary and Joe, they are growing into the mystery of God and Christ. Only in Mary's place, you know, Mary's case, God and her very own son. What was that like for her? I mean, here we have Luke interviewing this woman at the time of Luke's writing. She's probably 75, 80 years old. What must it have been like for her to grow into the mystery of who her son really was? She's telling Luke this at a mature age, having come into an understanding of that. But understand here in the text, just like you and I in our journey, she's growing into the mystery of who God and Christ is, and and what must have that been like for her to do that? We're going to get a hint or two uh, of insight tonight. Now, uh, the last time we were together, she and Joseph, you remember, marveled at the revelation of Simeon, who told them, your son is not just a savior to your people, the Jews, but he's going to be a light unto the Gentiles. He is going to be a light unto the entire planet. And so the mystery of of their son Joshua at that point had been elevated to an uh, an entirely higher dimension than that which they were aware of. What was that like for them? They are being placed upon a journey of discovery just as you and I are in this present hour. All right? So last week, big step forward for Mary. This week, we're going to find her taking a step or two back. And is that not just representative of the journey you and I are on? We'll we'll make those steps forward, right? But from time to time, God will have to sit us back down to learn a thing or two concerning just who he is. And we'll discover that tonight with Mary. So here now, picking it up in verse 39, Luke then picks a very interesting time out of the childhood of Christ to give us insight into Mary and Joe's journey of discovery, which will then in turn give us insight into our own. So let's get after it and go to work. Verse 39 now, chapter 2. When, underline that word when, when they, who's they, Joseph and Mary, when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, then they returned to Galilee. Or they returned to Galilee when? Well, when they had performed everything according to the Lord, right? Uh, They returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. The child continued to grow, verse 40, and become strong. Understand, Jesus had a normal physical development, all right? He didn't glow in the dark. He didn't float above the ground. I mean, he was just a normal, physically, just a normal kid growing up like any other Jewish boy. Uh, The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, uh, God had chosen Joseph and Mary, did he not, to be caretakers of their son. And I'm pretty sure everyone in this, uh, this room today uh, would consider this a pretty heady calling, right? I mean, to say that this was a big deal would be a bit of an understatement. Uh, imagine God, out of the billions of people, over the fullness of time, God chose Joe and Mary. Why them? Why? I mean, did they win the spiritual lottery somehow? Is it some random deal here? I mean, what was there about these two people that got God's attention? Mark it carefully. They returned to Galilee. When? 
Had you underline that word when there? When did they go home? When they had performed all that the law had commanded them to do, we're told. Don't miss this, guys. Tremendous picture being painted here in the Word of God, all right? Understand that what Luke is telling us, that when they had performed, that word when, when they had performed everything, then they got on with the rest of their lives. Luke is telling us they put God's business first. Now, I'm sure that like you and I, Mary and Joe had quite a bit going on at home. This entire ordeal was a profound disruption to their, their normal routine, no doubt, right? I mean, Joe's probably got a backlog of, of mission chairs that he's got yet to produce. There were no doubt things that they had to, to get to and take care of, but they did not get to their deal until God's stuff was taken care of. When they had fulfilled everything that God had told them to do, then they moved on with the rest of their lives. They put God first. That's the picture. What we discover is an example of people, Matthew 6, right? Seek first the kingdom of God, and then they concern themselves with with whatever it is that happens to be before them in their lives. Now understand, That is what God is looking for, all right? God is not looking for good looks. He's not looking for talent. He's not looking for ability. But it's what the prophet said to Asa, that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who are committed to his will. That's what God is looking for. That's all he wants. His eyes are searching the planet, even today, and all he's looking for is there's somebody who will be committed to my will. And if he finds a person that is committed to his will, he then begins to work with great power in their life. And he found such hearts in Joe and Mary, and I pray he finds such hearts among us. Now, just how committed were Joe and Mary? Well, notice verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. What Luke is telling us here is that Joe and Mary went well beyond the law. All that the law said was that the man had to go to Jerusalem on the feast day. The law did not command a wife, did not command a mother. She could stay home. There were, however, a number of devout women that would accompany their husbands. Mary was such a devout woman. Now, uh, understand, let, let's get into uh, the scene here, the trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem to get to the uh, Passover. Understand, this is a tough trip. It would have been a hundred mile or so uh, trip from the north. It would take over four days of travel. And Chad, let's take a look at this next slide. Uh, what they would do uh, is they would travel down here along the Jordan Valley. Uh, this issue of the Jews Uh, There was a hatred between them and Samaria. It's another Bible study. Of course, some of you know Christ would knock that wall down uh, in his ministry. So they would come over down uh, to the Jordan River, travel down that Jordan Valley, all right? And they would do, uh, they would break this trip into four legs, if you will, all right? Because this is a massive journey. Four legs, they would generally travel 25 miles, set up camp, spend the night, get up the next morning, break camp, travel another 25 miles or so, and, and the very last, by the way, very la- and this is, this is very interesting, the very last leg of the trip would have been from the town of, of Jericho, all right? And that, that last leg of the trip was really the roughest leg of the entire journey. Uh, understand that, and you can't see this uh, it, indicated by this illustration. But understand that Jericho is 853 feet below sea level, and Jerusalem is 2,133 feet above sea level. So you're talking about 23 miles on this last leg, ascending 3,000 feet in height. So it's all uphill. Now, here is a woman Isn't it interesting? She doesn't take the easy way out, right? She is committed to those things that are spiritual. She is there at her husband's side, and she endures the the, uh, uh, hardship of travel. Now, just in case you think this is a walk in the park, think again. Take a look at this. This is what the path even today looks like from Jericho to Jerusalem. 
Not an easy walk uh, 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 upon the street. And yet, here is a woman that was committed to this journey. All right? Well, beginning in verse 42 then, what we've been waiting for, uh, finally, the preteen Messiah is on the scene. Unique text here, found only in Luke, verse 42. And when he became 12, mark that, 12, they went up there. Why? According to the custom of the feast. It is interesting in the scriptures, and we'll see this a little bit later in the last couple of verses, that whenever you find um, any people or group of people traveling to Jerusalem, uh, regardless of whether their point of origin is north, south, east, or west, the Bible always says, up to Jerusalem. And regardless of whether north, south, east, or west, when they leave, it's always down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I find that fascinating. Jerusalem, of course, capital city, going to be the Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem, a representative of the kingdom to come. And so I think it's very interesting throughout the Bible, regardless of direction, it's always up to Jerusalem. And the text will always say down from Jerusalem. Where was I? Verse 42. So they went up there. Why? According to the custom of the feast. They went up there according to the custom of the feast. What Luke is referring to, his first century readers here would have understood. They'd be aware of this. Luke is telling us that Jesus was trained just like every other little Jewish boy in that era. At six years of age, Jesus would have joined what was known as the house of the book. All right. Within the local synagogue, they would have hired a, a full-time teacher. This man would have had to uh, uh, have been a, a married man, a father of children who are now grown and gone and faithful to the Lord. And what he would do is he would take, in, in, in this case, all the six-year-old boys from Nazareth, and for four years, he would sit them down and teach them Genesis through Malachi. So, so you had four years of children's Bible studies in the Old Testament is what you had there. Think VBS on performance-enhancing drugs, all right? This is VBS on steroids, essentially. Then at age 10, with that foundation laid, they would then begin to teach these boys in the Jewish rabbinic tradition. In other words, having studied the Bible, they would now study what we would call commentaries for the next couple of years. They would begin to be trained upon what the rabbis had to say about the Old Testament. Then skip 12, then at age 13, he would go through what we would call his bar mitzvah. Bar meaning son, mitzvah meaning law. He would now become at age 13 a son of the law, no longer under the direct authority of Mary and Joseph. You would at age 13 be considered a son of the law under the authority of the law of God. Now at age 12, for the first time now, he would be taken to the temple during the Passover and mom and dad would be giving him a tour of the temple. This is where you can go. Uh, this room over here is where you cannot go. This is where you find the priest to say these kinds of prayers. And, and, and this is where uh, you know, uh, the offerings uh, for such and such are taken. So the year before he goes under the law, he is given instruction by his parents concerning the temple. So this now is that event. He is 12 years old. Mom and dad have now given him a tour of the temple. Well, then the story takes a turn south here in verse 43. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, this would be eight days, Passover, uh, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey. Remember what we said about this? A day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Now, at first glance, this seems to hit us as very hard to believe, does it not? How do you lose your kid for a whole day? Well, let's unpack this uh, just a bit here. The scene was this. Again, you're, you're traveling in large caravans, perhaps several hundred people. This is a class reunion, a family reunion, all rolled into one here. Uh, those numbers, of course, afforded you a degree of protection as you're journeying through the wilderness. Uh, women would always walk with women. 
All right, and, and men would always walk with men, and so you'd have all these women way up front, you'd have the little kids in the middle, and then you'd have the men in the rear, and they were to ensure that nobody was left behind. Well, way to go, Joe, right? Oh, maybe not so fast. As parents, you know, do you not? As parents, you know the degree to which you watch your child is based in large part upon that child's behavior, right? I mean, if you got a kid, if they're not starting it on fire, they're killing it, right? It's what, oh, well, I got to watch this kid 24-7. You don't know, no tell him what kind of trouble he will get. And what, what must it have been like for Joe and Mary to have a 12-year-old that as far as they can remember, the kid's never done anything wrong, no doubt today they'd probably write a parenting book, right? And on the back cover it would say, what's your problem, man? You know, just be consistent and, and just, it just stay the course and your kids will end up marvelous while the rest of us are not raising the Son of God. Uh, we understand that. Uh, but listen, you know, I mean, you just know that Joe and Mary were thinking, I, I don't need to watch this kid. He's on autopilot. I mean, he's never done anything wrong. He does everything perfect. And so you can imagine Joe saying to Mary, well, well Mary's got him. And, and Mary thinking amongst her, herself, well, well, Joe's got him. They travel to the other side of Jericho. They're setting up camp, getting re ready for dinner. Hey, where's Josh? What do you mean, where's Josh? I thought you had him. Joshua is Hebrew for Jesus, in case I'm throwing any of you, all right? I thought you had Well, I thought I'd had Well, I thought, and so you can envision these two fallen human beings going at each other over whose fault it is they've lost the Son of God. And so here they are, no doubt, throughout the camp. And there it is, verse 44. Have you seen Josh? Have you seen Josh? And nobody has seen Joshua. Now, parents, you know, if you ever lost your kid for a few minutes, man, that can make your heart stop, can it not? And so here they are now, a whole day out. Again, what, what was that like emotionally? Imagine your kid missing the whole time you've been gone from Jerusalem, and, and now you've got a day trip all the way back to Jerusalem, and it's all the way uphill, right? And so there's mental, uh, there is physical exhaustion in front of them, and, and we might just want to consider that when Mary falls off the rails here in a little bit, all right? Well, then in verse 46, fascinating text here, uh, verse 46. Then after three days, isn't that amazing how you see that just over and over throughout the Bible? After three days, they found him in the temple and underline this, sitting in the midst of the doctors. You've got doctors in the King James. You might have teachers in your translation as I do, but underline that sitting in the midst of of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. This was a rabbinic form of teaching. We'll get to that. Verse 47, and all who heard him were amazed. Underline that word amazed as well. Uh, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, isn't that interesting? They found him on the third day. Three days, of course, Bible students, you know, speaks to the resurrection, right? Here they were with Jesus. He was then removed from their presence, if you will. And then on the third day, they find him again. Even as Jesus would later leave his disciples upon that cross and three days later would join them again. Over and over throughout the scriptures, you see this third day uh, motif recurring to just a remarkable degree where, where you have all these spiritual activities throughout the text, Old Testament, New Testament, all, all these spiritual activities coming to pass on the third day. And of course, all ultimately pointing to the resurrection. Far too many examples to enumerate within the time we have um, tonight. But man, you study this out, you will marvel at the symmetry of the scriptures. A again, let me continue to press this upon you. Understand, there are dimensions to the construction of the word of God that betray our capacity. The degree to which the, the resurrection is somehow mathematically woven into the fiber of the scriptures is remarkable. There's a, a profound mystery in that, again, that we don't back off from, but rather we allow that to compel us to worship. Tracking? Now, 
back on the ground here, if you will. They had a day and a half or so just getting back to Jerusalem, right? And the better part of another day just trying to find the kid. Imagine the reality of this. This is Passover. You've got three billion people dumping out of the city trying to get home after the feast, and you're sort of swimming upstream here. Hey, has anybody seen Joshua? Has anybody, have you seen our boy? And maybe they said, I don't know. Maybe they said, man, we got to find a priest and pray. And so they go to the, what we do know is they go to the temple. Hey, can can you pray for us? We lost our little boy. Of course we can pray. Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry you lost your boy. So, uh, how old is he? What does he look like? Oh, okay. Yeah, we got your boy up over there. A pretty remarkable young man. Now, Jesus was in what was known as the Chamber of Hewn Stone. Let's take a look at the slide. There are a couple of problems with this illustration, but it should help you get a hold of the idea. In this chamber here, you've got a semicircle of stone bleachers three tiers high. On one side of the semicircle, you have 35 doctors of the law. You've got a younger Nicodemus there. You've got a younger Joseph of Arimathea there. You've got all of the great teachers of Israel. And then on the other side of the semicircle, you have the other 35 doctors of the law. And then in the center back there, you would have essentially uh, the throne of the high priest. Now, I want you to mark there, had you underline this, the Greek comes into the English here as sitting in the midst. So you have 71 of the great teachers and rulers of Israel, and then they're in the middle somewhere where you would have either a speaker or a presenter, or in the case of a tribunal, the accused. So in the middle of, of, of the greatest, the best, and brightest minds that the nation has to offer, in the middle of all that, you've got the preteen 12-year-old Jesus. Now, You've got to appreciate what this scene must have looked like. Little Jesus in this society, he is a hillbilly living on government cheese. Do you understand that? All right? He is from the hill country of Galilee. He probably, he's dressed shabby. He, he probably speaks in a Galilean accent. And now this 12-year-old little boy, and don't mistake this. Don't mistake what the text is presenting here. It's not that they're trading questions here. It's not that they're teaching him. And Jesus is going, well, I, I just don't understand. Tell me what that means. What the text is presenting here, listen, is the mechanics of rabbinic teaching. Listening to a proposition or listening to an inquiry and then responding to that with a kind of guiding question or leading question. This was a form of rabbinic teaching. He is teaching them the law of God. Stunning. Bible students, you recognize this, right? Uh, people would, in the Gospels, people would come to Christ and they would ask him a question. And he would often answer their question with what? A question. Rabbinic teaching. Good master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Good master? Why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, and that's God. Oh, are, are you prepared to recognize I'm the Messiah? So Jesus lead, it was leading and guiding that man to his deity, not denying it. All right? And so this is what, this is how they did this. I mean, you are, you are in this form of teaching seeking to guide the student, lead the student to discover a truth in their own mind rather than just telling it to them. Are you with me? So, so here is the 12-year-old Messiah, and he's giving them questions and giving them answers, and he is guiding them into a deeper understanding of the law. Mark their response in verse 47. That word I had you underline, amazed. Very interesting word. Very, very strong Greek word. It has a number of literal meanings. It means to be absurdly astonished. It means to be put out of one's wits. It means to throw out of position, to throw into wonderment. We, we would say their minds were blown by this event. This is a mind-blowing event. Here's a 12-year-old little kid putting the doctors of the law on a bus and taking them to school. Right? Right? Well, then notice verse 48, you got to love moms. <laughs> when they saw him, they were astonished. Now, I'm going to have you underline it, three words in here. Astonished, said, and anxiously. We'll get to them. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father. Jesus is going to say, whose father? Behold, your father and I have been, and then underline anxiously looking for you. So again, bear with me, astonished. 
Uh, they were astonished, underline that. His mother said, underline that, and anxiously, underline that as well. Now, this is just like moms, is it not? I mean, you're looking cool, you're looking awesome. Mom doesn't care. She just busts right in there, grabs you by the ear, starts making you look stupid. And that's what Mary is doing here to 12-year-old Jesus. He's wowing the crowds with his theological insight, and Mary just busts in there and breaks up the Bible party. Listen, Mary has forgotten whose son the Lord Jesus is. Your father and I. Do you know the trauma that you've put us through, young man? Do, do you know the heartache we have gone through? And now Jesus is going to straighten Mary out here in a minute. But the exchange here uh, in the text, in the original language, very revealing with its meaning coming out of the inflections in the Greek grammar. The verbs used here in verse 48 are all very intensive on Mary's part. This word astonished, it means shocked. When Luke says, when Luke records his mother said to him, that verb for said it indicates a reproach. There's a rebuke. Mary has a toot going on here, right? But, but what parent wouldn't? She says, why have you treated us this way? Your father and I have been looking anxiously. This word anxiously, very strong word, literally means to torment. Okay? Now catch this. Mary is saying, why have you done this? I haven't done anything wrong. Why have you done this? You've tormented us here. The idea in the Greek syntax, and, and some of us parents will understand this, what is being communicated in the Greek here is a kind of blame shifting going on where Mary is seeking to justify herself for losing the kid by assigning the blame to the kid. And again, Jesus is going to correct her. Now, Got to give Mary a break here for at least two, probably more, at least two reasons that I can think of. Uh, number one, again, who among us can escape from that, that potent emotional mixture of fear and stress and anxiety uh, upon losing a child, particularly over this period of time? Uh, despite what the Catholic Church tells you, Mary, remarkable though she was, was just another sinner in need of a Savior like you and I. By her own admission, you remember back in chapter 1. Number two, another reason we need to give Mary a break is because we, listen, we, we just don't know if you've been following this story, after Gabriel paid her a visit 12 years ago, we just don't know what kind of ongoing communication was going on between heaven and Mary. We just don't know. Was it a one-time deal? You know, was it, was it Gabriel's appearance unto her and that was the last thing she's heard from heaven? Well, we don't know. But the narrative here doesn't exactly suggest she saw Gabe yesterday, does it? Now, if Mary had only received that one revelation, oh, you know what that's like, right? God might have done something in your life uh, unbelievably fantastic 10 years ago, but that was 10 years ago. A lot of waters passed under the bridge, right? And now you're worried about a mortgage and health insurance and all this stuff. Listen, it's very easy for you and I to forget those watershed spiritual events in our life where, where we just felt the nearness of God and, and just the manifest presence of God was, was just there and there was just that nearness and that closeness, right? That's why, listen, it's important to share your testimony from time to time with one another. It, we got to guard against that. I mean, it's just that there's, it just brings you back to what God has done. And man, if you haven't done that in a while, might I encourage you to do that? There's something that just happens there where you're bringing back up that just that beautiful time God has been working in your life. I never get tired of hearing my wife's testimony. It brings me tears. It, I, I don't know that she's ever told it where, where it hasn't brought me tears. It's why I also recommend that you journal. You're building a memorial of your journey. You're dropping time markers. You're going to go back and you're going to see how God has answered 
prayer. It's going to build your faith. And it's what Joshua did. You remember, for, for those of you that were with us, I don't know, several years ago now. But it's what Joshua did when he crossed the Jordan River. He built this big memorial. Now, I'm not saying build a big pile of stones in your living room, though that would be a good conversation starter at parties. Um, but journaling accomplishes that for you. You're building a kind of memorial is what you are doing. And so maybe 12 years have gone by and that revelation was just a distant memory to Mary. And, and now she's caught, and who wouldn't? And now she's caught up in the moment and she seems to have forgotten just who it is that Jesus is. And I think that the same thing can happen to you and I. We can get all caught up in some set of circumstances and, and we just forget who it is that, that Jesus is. We, we forget that the Son of God is right where he needs to be in our lives and, and he's just reigning and, and orchestrating and, and everything in reality is going exactly according to plan just as it is here. We far too easily forget who Jesus is, particularly in the storm. And that's when he's most active in our lives, okay? And so now Jesus is going to correct her. Let's look at verse 49. And he said to them, now these are the first recorded words of Christ, two penetrating questions. Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. Can you be encouraged by that? This is Mary and Joe, and God is their son, and they didn't get it. Give yourself a break. It's okay to grow in this mystery of God and Christ. I think it's John 20, 29. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. Be gentle with yourself as you are growing in this mystery of God and Christ because you are being harder on yourself than, than God is. Mary and Joe are right there with the Son of God being their own son, and they did not get it, all right? So, but they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. Now, isn't that interesting? Again, Mary just said, your father and I have been tormented here. And Jesus says, just very matter-of-factly, reminding uh, Mary here, I am in my father's house. Do you understand, Mom, that Joe's not my dad? All right? May I remind you of whose son I am? Again, even as we need to be reminded just who it is that Christ is. Now, the tone here and the text, very different in, in the Greek from what we had with Mary. Jesus is being firm, but there's a gentleness here. There's no hint of disrespect, and we will find that Luke will make that point emphatically in verse 51. But again, I want you to notice, watch this, Jesus, again, he's using what? The rabbinic form of teaching here by asking Mary a couple of questions. He, he answers her single question with two questions to guide her. And the two pieces of truth that he is seeking to lead her into is, number one, look, Joseph is not my father. Have you forgotten that I am the son of God? And number two, the second piece of truth he's leading her into is, where else would I be but teaching the word of God? Remember, the Bible calls Jesus the word become flesh. Now, some translations have in my father's house. Other translations have about my father's business. Either way, what he was doing was teaching the word of God. That is the clear context. And in that sense, he's in the father's house. He's about the father's business. This is an absolute seminal moment here because Luke is trying to tell us that Jesus at 12 recognizes he is the Messiah. He has an understanding of his mission and why he is here. Jesus knows that he is the Son of God. Very clear indication in the text. He has an awareness that he is about to be, uh, he, that he is to be about doing the will of his Father. Luke wants us to understand just that. Now, again, verse 50. 
Mary and Joe, be gentle upon yourself. Mary and Joe, just like you and I, they are growing into the mystery of who God and Christ is. Luke records for us specifically, inspired by the Spirit of God, right? 2 Timothy 3.16. Luke records for us under the Spirit that they did not understand what he was saying. It's what Jesus said to his disciples in John 13. What I do now, you do not know, but you will hereafter. And they will, they will understand down the road, Mary and Joe will. They, they just don't understand now. And yet, here's what I want you to see. They're growing in their mystery of God, uh, coming into their understanding of the mystery of God and Christ. They don't get it all, but they don't bail. Mary and Joseph continued to be faithful in what God had called them to do, though they don't have the full revelation that will yet come unto them. This is faith, right? Again, the unknown mysteries of God, wherever you're at in this present hour, are not to push us away from God, but are rather to compel us to worship and pursue him, worship him. It's exactly what we're going to find Mary doing in verse 51. But, as we all should understand very practically, in the heat of the moment, there's Jesus asking questions, and man, they're just glad they found him, right? Right? And so Mary and Joe, what in, your, what in your name are you talking about, son? Aye, we don't get it. Come on, let's go home. Finally, uh, tonight, verse 51. And he went down with them. You see that? There's that direction again, down from Jerusalem. He went down with them and came to Nazareth. And here I want you to underline this. We've got some different words in our translations. But he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he continued in subjection. Underline that. You might have submission. You might have obedience there in your translation. He continued in subjection and submission and obedience to them. And his mother treasured a diataros in the Greek, their treasure. She kept this in her heart. It was etched permanently upon her heart. All these things. Verse 52. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. All right. Well, well, Jesus knows he's right. He knows mom and stepdad don't get it. And yet, mark the submission of Christ. This is remarkable. Man, you got to think this through. Most of us would agree that submission is a, an area of great difficulty in life, is it not? If we are put in the right set, because of what the Bible calls the pride of life, if we're put in the right set of circumstances, our default is to resist submission, to rebel against submission. Now, when submission gets particularly difficult is when we have to submit to a person whom we feel is our inferior. You're at work. And you're forced to submit to a supervisor or a manager, maybe half your age, half your talent. Maybe they're the owner's son, the biggest doofus on the face of the planet. And if it weren't for the family relationship, maybe they'd be in the mail room, right? But, man, you've got to submit to them. If you, you want to keep your job, you've got to submit. Ah! And, of course, this goes way back, right? Remember when you were a little kid, you'd say to your older brother or sister, you're not the boss of me. Nobody likes submission, again, particularly when you must submit to a perceived inferior. Now, what do you suppose this must have been like for Christ? I mean, he's God. You talk about submitting yourself to inferiors. Jesus, the book of Philippians tells us, submitted himself, made himself subject to his own creation. And I don't have to remind you about the passion, do I? Beat to within an inch of his life, humiliated, mocked, spit upon, tortured, killed by his own creation. What I would like us to understand, and here's, what, here's where we will land the plane, is that if we say we are Christians, that is to say that we are seeking to be Christ-like, and if we want to be Christ-like, like Christ, we will be about our Father's business. Just as Christ says here. If we want to call ourselves Christians, little Christs, 
then we, we will be about our Father's business. What is the Father's business as it concerns you and I? Is it that we would dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's? Is, is it that we would obey the commands of God in order that we might somehow secure salvation or earn favor with God? Or could it just be that we submit to the will of God because he, your designer, knows what is best for you, and if you come into that, he is then glorified. Christ, in submission to the will of the Father, already died on that cross because you could never dot all your I's and cross your T's. He's done that for you. Staying on the path of being a student of the Word of God that you might submit to God out of a growing understanding and appreciation and awe of all that He is, all that He has done, all that He wants to yet do for you, that is how you are to be about the Father's business. Seeking to bring forth obedience out of a loving, thankful heart on your way to what is actually best for you, for you to flourish as a human being in order to glorify God before a troubled and lost and dark world. Let us keep all that we learn in that grid. All right? The commands of God, this is not some granddaddy up in the sky trying to be religious, lowering the boom on you. If you think that, you don't got the gospel. All right? The commands of God are an invitation to the best life possible that God might be glorified, that lost might be found, period. Let us keep all that we learn in that grid as an invitation to what is best for you, that he is glorified, that others will see that, and lust might be found. Now, at some point, and it's crazy how this happens so differently, but at some point in your Christian experience, what is already in your head, and you'll know when this happens, it's, it's very, very different. At some point in your Christian experience, what you already have in your head is going to make its way into your heart and it is going to rock your soul. Hey. Man, God is real. Eternity is reality. In this life, the word says it's just a vapor. I mean, all this stuff I've been studying, why hasn't it translated? What in the world am I doing? Why am I in the world? Why in the world am I wasting so much time on stuff that that doesn't amount to a hill of beans? Man, man, I need to be about the Father's business. This is real. Sir Isaac Newton, 17th century scientist renowned for discovering the law of gravity. You know the cartoon version, Apple Falls on His Head, right? Well, he was a believer in Jesus Christ, and at the height of his career in mathematics and physics, he just decided to up and turn his full attention to God's word. A colleague of his said, dude, you're nuts. Tried to lure him back to the field of science. Come on, man, what are you doing? Do I have to throw a bunch more apples at your head? And Isaac Newton said, you don't understand, quote, I don't want to be trifling away my time when I should be about the king's business. Unquote. Even though he retained his interest in science, theological pursuits became his top priority because what he had known for so long in his head, friends, had finally found its way into his heart and it rocked him. There's a difference. There's a difference. He found a much more profound and compelling mystery in God in Christ than he ever did studying the physical properties of the universe that God created. So it just rocked him. This week, wonder and marvel over the great mystery of God in Christ and be okay with where you are and in, in, in growing into that. In here, be okay with that. But go and ask yourself in the quietness of your heart as well this week, whose business have I really been about? Have I been about the 
father's business? Or have I really, for the most part, just kind of been about my own? And then the answer that comes back to your heart, be gentle. This is not God condemning. All of that is over. It was over at the cross. This is God and fighting and encouraging, wanting more for you than you presently have. Whatever answer comes back, you just take that to God in prayer this week. God, would you fan the flames of my heart? God, I, just, I, I am about my business. And, and would you awaken me to have a real desire to pursue you that I might redeem the time, that I might be about what it is that, that you would have me to be about for my own well-being, that you might be glorified, and that others might be drawn unto you. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the men and women in this room, most of all for Christ who has saved them. Thank you for being for us when we are so often against ourselves without knowing it. Father, would you continue this week to show us just how short this life is? Would you begin to uh, continue to illuminate how you have gifted us, uh, if you have illuminated that, would you help us to develop what you've already uh, enabled us to see? Would you give us in all of that the boldness to then step out within the body and, and be about your business? And Lord, within this room, there is great variation with where we're, we're at with you. For those of us, God, I pray, for those of us that think they know you, but there's no real pursuit in their lives, Father, would you graciously begin to reveal yourself unto them that they might, for the first time, just marvel over the reality of who you are and, and just delight in you that their, their souls would be rocked by your glory. And for those of us, God, that are a little bit older in the Lord and those of us that have been walking with you for some time now, would you just take the crust off our hearts and all this revelation that you've put into our heads, would, would you begin to just make its way into our heart that we might just wake up and, and just really begin to concern ourselves with your business. Thank you, God, that this is an invitation, that there is no condemnation in Christ. Thank you for your incredible love and your patience with us. Thank you for pursuing us, God, even when we're running in the other direction. Thank you, Lord, that you're faster than us. Shed your love abroad in our hearts this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. All right.